Well, it is a great blessing to be with all of you this morning and to see some of you we haven't seen in this building for a little over a year now. And I hope all of you have the elements for the Lord's Supper with you already, either from home or from the table in the entryway. And Aaron will be leading us in the prayers for the supper right after our study this morning. And then we plan on singing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, which is number 438. And I give that number in case you're joining us at home and have the book, but we'll have it on the wall up here. And as usual, most of us are giving either online or through the mail, but there's a basket on the back table as well. And I'm just adding that because we haven't mentioned that for a while and uh, don't want to forget that. Um, this morning, as we get started, we just wanted to say a, a quick word of thanks to uh, Brother Al Ovidal for his service as a deacon over the past several years. He's recently stepped down, and so we really appreciate his service. And I was thinking this week of 1 Timothy 3, verse 13 where Paul says that those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so we pass along our thanks to Al for everything that he's done and will continue to do in terms of encouraging us at the church. And then we also wanted to give just a brief update on Victor Glover. You may remember that we've been praying for him over the past several months. He's a Christian brother who has been on the International Space Station for the past several months, since November, I think, is when they launched up there. And so he splashed back to Earth in the Gulf of Mexico this morning at 3 or 3.30. And so they're back safely on Earth, and we're certainly hoping he could be back with his family and also his Christian family and whatever worship that they're doing and whatever form that they're doing there. So I wanted to give a brief update, some good news that uh, Brother Victor is back with us. As our custom has been, we're starting today with a brief summary of God's plan for saving us. We know from Scripture that we have sinned, and those sins have separated us from God. He is holy, we are not, but God made a way for us to come back. And God sent His only Son to live a perfect life. He was crucified, He offered Himself as a sacrifice for our sins, and in response, we believe the message, and we turn away from sin, we confess Jesus as being the Son of God, and then we allow ourselves to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins, at which point the Christian life begins. And once again, we have an example this week. Several days ago, we got an update from Don Blackwell, who preaches for the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Some of you may remember Mark Teske as a guest speaker here about a year and a half ago. Uh, came up from down south and filled us in on uh, GBN and the good work that they're doing. Well, just over a week ago, they posted a picture of Evan, who was baptized uh, about a week ago as a result of the teaching that he had access to online. Uh, Evan reached out to the Gospel Broadcasting Network. They put him in touch with the West Broward Church of Christ in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and they had the privilege of baptizing Evan uh, for the forgiveness of his sins. And so we rejoice with Evan and that congregation down at West Broward this morning. And we share this by way of encouragement. Uh, what Evan has done this week, you can do this morning. If you have any questions about this, if you want to study the Bible together, uh, get in touch and we'd love to meet with you. Before we get to the study of the Word of God this morning and speaking of people learning about the Gospel online, we want to pass along another brief update on our website. We've shared little bits of pieces of statistics over the past several weeks here. And it's always interesting to me to see where people are from when they access our site. And in case you're joining us on the phone and cannot see this, uh, this chart indicates that a vast majority of people visit our website from right here in the United States. And that's at 79% of the people who join us online come from the U.S. Uh, beyond this, the people are joining us from China. I did not expect them to come in number two. Uh, but with a huge population, uh, that kind of makes sense, I guess. So China, then India followed by Canada, the Philippines, the Bahamas, Mexico, the United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, and then it trails off from there. Uh, but we share this just as a reminder that people are finding us online, and this is where they're coming from when they get to our website. It would be a serious understatement to suggest that we are living in uncertain times. And I'm reminded of uh, Joshua's command as the people get ready to cross over the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land, as he tells them, you need to follow the Ark of the Covenant very carefully. Don't get left behind. Follow the Ark carefully. And the reason he gives in Joshua 3 verse 4 is so that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. In other words, they are in a completely new situation. They'd never done this before. And so they were to pay special attention to following the Lord very carefully. And that's where we are right now. We've been through more than a year of uncharted territory. 
We've learned a lot over the last year or so. We've had some rather severe restrictions from our local health department. We've had a number of our members have been extremely ill over the past year. Several of you have lost loved ones. And now it seems as if we are perhaps starting to come out on the other side of this. And it, we also understand that there is still a lot of uncertainty about what comes next. And so today and next Lord's Day, instead of focusing on what to do or what not to do, instead of getting even more stressed out about our circumstances, I want us to go to the Word of God for some encouragement. And I need some hope right now. I need an uplifting message from the Word of God. So I want us to go to the Word for some encouragement and reassurance. And as we look at the Word of God for some encouragement, I want us to think about a request from one of our senior saints. And this is a request for a lesson on the 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23 is perhaps one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. In fact, I wonder how many times we've heard this psalm. For most of us, I would guess dozens of times at the very least. I know I've heard it on movies. Um, we've read this psalm. The last time I preached on Psalm 23 was back in October 2007. So I know you all remember that, and uh, we don't need to review it from that point of view, but there's a chance we've heard it hundreds of times, if not more, in our lifetimes. I've heard it on movies. Sometimes, you know, if anybody knows anything about the Christian faith or God and his people, they know something about the 23rd Psalm. This is a song that we sometimes sing as a congregation even today. Some of you may remember back in the olden days when we actually used songbooks made out of paper I think we had this song at least three different versions in our songbook set to music. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. We would sing that uh, to various arrangements, not to mention many other songs referring to God as our shepherd. But we go to Psalm 23 for encouragement and we do it with good reason. And this is what we need today. We need some encouragement from God. In the 23rd Psalm, in English, it contains 119 words divided out into six verses over 15 lines. Of those 119 words, 90 of them are only one syllable. Microsoft Word analyzes highlighted text by using the flesh Kincaid method and suggests the 23rd Psalm has a reading level of 1.6. And so that's something that can be understood, they say, by the average first grader, at least the way they look at it there. Another online tool suggests a reading level of second or third grade. But either way, the words in this psalm are simple and they're very easy to understand. This is something that all of us can get. We can understand what's going on here. But for now, let's get started by looking at all six verses of the 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6, a psalm of King David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup, overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Before we dive into the bulk of this psalm next week, this morning I just want us to really focus in on verse 1, because verse 1 is what this psalm is all about. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the theme. Everything else in Psalm 23 is an explanation of this truth in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so today then we have a sermon with one point. And the one point, the one big idea today is this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is what we need to get out of this psalm this morning. So we'll look at this verse one little piece at a time, starting with the word Lord. When David refers to the Lord... You'll notice that most translations have it in all caps, indicating that we're dealing with God's personal name, his proper name, sometimes translated as Yahweh or Jehovah. 
transliterated into English, one English letter for every Hebrew letter, not a translation, but a transliteration, basically bringing it directly letter for letter from one language to another. It comes across as Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> With no vowels, it's really, it's almost impossible for, for us to know the correct pronunciation. And that's the issue here. We have a name for God, his proper personal name, that is somewhat unpronounceable. As I understand it, the meaning behind it is basically I am. And it goes back to God meeting Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Remember that? So here we have Moses. He was working as a shepherd at that point, wasn't he? Speaking of Psalms and shepherds, Moses was a shepherd. He was raised in Egypt, but he fled at the age of 40. He's been serving as a shepherd for 40 years now, and so now at the age of 80, God has some big plans for Moses. He wants this elderly man to go back to Egypt and to demand that Pharaoh let his people go. Well, if you remember Exodus chapters 3 and 4, Moses gives a series of excuses. God, I can't do that for the following five reasons. And he gives a series of reasons why he can't do it. And in that process, as Moses tries to anticipate these objections, Moses says to God in Exodus 3.13, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That makes almost no sense, does it? That doesn't help in my mind. It, it almost got worse in a way. But the I am has sent me to you. As I understand it, though, that is the basis of God's personal name. He is the existing one. He has always been in existence. He will always be in existence. And so when David says that the Lord is my shepherd, he's basically referring to God as the I am. This is God's personal and proper name. The next part of this is that the Lord is my shepherd. I would point out, first of all, that this psalm is very personal. In fact, I hope as we read it, we noticed all of the personal pronouns in this passage. If I have counted correctly, David uses the words I, mine, or me a total of 17 times in these six verses. And he's not bragging. This is not arrogance in this passage, but he's emphasizing how personal this is. The Lord isn't just a shepherd. He's not the shepherd. He's not Israel's shepherd. He's not the one and only true almighty shepherd. All of those would have been accurate statements to say, but he is my shepherd personally. Me, David, is saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the same goes for us. The Lord can also be our shepherd. And so the Lord was David's shepherd, but he's also our shepherd. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. In ancient Israel and in most cultures today, the work of a shepherd was difficult and dirty, and it often fell on the youngest in the family, almost like drawing the short straw. Nobody wanted to watch the sheep because it was hard, dirty work. It was not glamorous at all. David, as a young man, had to stay home and take care of the sheep as his older brothers went off to war. Remember that? Shepherds had to live with their sheep 24-7, 365 days a year, no vacation time, day, night, summer, winter, rain, shine, in all conditions. Their job was to protect and guide and feed and to keep those sheep alive and healthy, primarily for the production of wool, but also sometimes for milk or for meat. And very quickly, good shepherds would get to know their sheep personally. They would name them, and so they would get to know them by name, almost like our pets today. They would know their strengths and weaknesses. They would get to know their personalities, their tendencies, their weaknesses, and so on. And in the same way, those sheep would get to know their shepherd as well. And so that was a two-way relationship. They would get to know each other out there in the wilderness over months or years. Unfortunately, we have become somewhat disconnected from sheep in our society, haven't we? I don't know if we hang out with sheep on a regular basis. <laughs> I certainly don't. I don't know if any of you do. And so for several years now, I've been able to attend the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival in early September at the Jefferson County Fairgrounds. If you want to meet me there this year, I would love to meet you there. 
Uh, this is maybe my third or fourth year this year, but it is an interesting experience and uh, I needed to know more about sheep. And so I've been out there as a learning experience. One of the highlights for me the last few years has been seeing the Crook and Whistle Nationals. I had no idea this was a thing. A nationwide competition for shepherds and sheepdogs. Absolutely amazing. From several football fields away, they will direct their dogs just by whistling and they will guide their sheep around various obstacles on the other end of the field before bringing them back into the pen one by one. And they do that by whistling and by giving signals to the dogs. Another highlight is the sheep shearing demonstration. I don't know if you know this, it takes maybe 90 seconds to shear a sheep. It is fast. And this guy is good. And this is what he does. He travels from farm to farm all day long, every day of the week, shearing sheep because it's, it's a skill. And not everybody has that skill. And this guy is good and they pay him to do it. And so he comes and he demonstrates several times during this festival. They get several pounds of wool off of each one. They also have a barn with a number of lambs in it. And several UW veterinary science students were there feeding them. Uh, the one on the right, I believe, was about 12 hours old and was just born the night before that I got there on the day that I was there. And then you can also eat sheep. And uh, that was a little bit weird, all right? Uh, going and seeing all of this and then going into the, <laughs> the food barn, I guess. Um, I missed the lamb brats by just a few minutes. Last year, they ran out right before I walked up to the window. So I wanna go back and get one this year. Uh, in addition to the food, they also have two barns full of everything you can imagine made out of wool. Uh, wool thread, wool yarn, wool socks, wool sweaters, everything wool. And that was an interesting experience. But this is right here near us, just a few minutes uh, east of here in Jefferson County. And I share this to give us another opportunity to become more familiar with sheep because in our society, most of us living in the city of Madison, we have become disconnected from this. And so we don't really understand it, especially, I guess we'd say as city slickers, we might uh, get something uh, benefit from going over to Jefferson in September. We don't need a PhD in sheepology, but even without an extensive education or experience, most of us probably know something about sheep. That sheep are not really known for being very intelligent, are they? They are needy creatures. They have no natural defenses. They don't have claws or fangs. They are known for following. To be called a sheep is not really a compliment, is it? We've heard that thrown out a, t a time or two over the past year or so, haven't we? Oh, you're doing this or that? Well, you're just a sheep. And that's not a compliment whatsoever. Sheep are, are not known for thinking on their own. They're very easily spooked, as I understand it. Sometimes running in sheer terror from the sound of a plastic bag stuck in a tree flapping in the breeze. Uh, they've been known to be paralyzed by the sight of an approaching fire, even to the point of being burned, unable to make the decision to move. There's a fire coming. Oh no, what do I do? And they just freeze and they stay right there. They've been known to tip over and not be able to get back up. With a full load of wool, they're somewhat top heavy, especially when they're wet and they may need help getting back up. They need to be led. They're very dependent on the leadership of others. And so they have a tendency to wander. They eat and they eat and they eat and they have a way of eating themselves right off the edge of a cliff or into some other form of danger. Sheep haven't changed too much over the past 3000 years since this psalm was first written. It's a psalm that crosses cultures and time itself. And even if we aren't shepherds ourselves, most of us have at least some concept of what sheep and shepherds do. Most of us have seen sheep. We've been to the county fair. We've driven by farms in the countryside. Some of you know one of my first home visits as a preacher in Wisconsin was to a sheep farmer down near Evansville. And here I was about 20 years old and I showed up for some reason just as they were loading sheep onto a trailer to take from one farm to another. And this older Christian man says, hey, you want to help me? And I said, well, sure. I don't know what I'm doing. And so there I was chasing sheep into a trailer for several hours. Uh, the son in that family was on the high school football team down in Evansville. We were tackling sheep together and I learned that sheep can jump. Did you know that a sheep can jump over a high school football player? 
I learned that that day. I had no idea they had that ability in them. They can jump over a high school football player. I learned quite a bit that day. And this is probably a good place to point out that we are indeed the sheep in this picture, aren't we? It's not flattering, but we are the followers. We are the ones who get lost all the time. We're the ones who are quite likely to eat ourselves right off the side of a cliff. We're the ones who need to be tackled from time to time for our own good. As the prophet says in Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That's us. That's how we're pictured in the Bible. We are the sheep in this picture. In fact, I've read that we as God's people are referred to as being sheep more than 200 times in the word of God. I had no idea that number was so high. And so the Lord is my shepherd. This leads us to the last part of this. Because the Lord is David's shepherd, he is able to say, I shall not want. The word translated as want here in the New American Standard Bible is a word referring to lacking something. It refers to being in need. It's been translated elsewhere in the Bible as being empty or scarce. The NIV has David saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Eugene Peterson in the message, which is a paraphrase, not a translation, he says, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. And that's the thought behind this passage. So the idea is with God as my shepherd, I will never be in need. I will never be empty. God is all I need. The Lord is my shepherd and he is enough. He is everything that I need. And this is a message we need to hear today. If this past year has taught us anything, it's taught us that we have no idea what's coming next. Isn't that a true statement? We have no idea what's coming next. So many things have happened that we never could have predicted. And yet through it all, hasn't God taken care of us as a congregation? We have not been in want. A year ago, I remember one of our families making a few toilet paper deliveries to our members. Just a few years ago, I could have never even imagined referring to a toilet paper delivery in a sermon. <laughs> And yet here we are, right? As a congregation, we took care of each other. You remember that situation a year ago. God took care of us as a congregation. We understand Paul's promise in Philippians 4.17 when he said that my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We as a church, we have seen that to be true. We have experienced this personally. On their own, sheep need everything. But with God as our shepherd, we need nothing. And so he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, I shall not be in need. So where's God and what we're going through right now? What is God's role in this? Well, it depends. He is the good shepherd, but what role he takes in our lives, that's completely up to us. And to take advantage of what comes next in this Psalm, we need to let him be the shepherd. He's willing to be my shepherd and he's willing to be your shepherd. But that requires us admitting that we are sheep. And as I said before, that is sometimes hard to do. It's hard to give up that illusion of control of our lives. It's hard to turn over the leadership of our lives to somebody else. But that's what the Christian life is. We hear the good news, we believe it, and then we turn back to God in humble submission and obedience. And we allow God to be God. And that's what this Psalm is all about. He's our shepherd. And because he's our shepherd, we shall not want. He is enough. God is all that we need. He's guiding us. He's watching over us, walking with us through this. And everything in the rest of Psalm 23 hinges on this in verse one, because he is our shepherd, everything else in this Psalm is true as well. And that's where I hope we can pick up next week and look at the remaining verses of Psalm 23. Before we close this part of our service with a prayer, I just want to share a two verse prophecy from Revelation 7, Verses 16 and 17. On the island of Patmos, the door cracks open to the future just a little bit. And John the Apostle sees something in the distant future. And referring to God's people, this is what he says. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And we're looking forward to that. 
So let's close this part of the service by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the great I am, the shepherd of your people. Today we come to you as your sheep, knowing that we need you at all times. Thank you for being merciful to us, and thank you for bringing us together safely this morning. This morning, we're thankful for the progress we've seen with our COVID numbers here in Dane County. We know that each number that we see on the news represents a person who is suffering. We pray that our situation, therefore, would continue to improve as you allow us to serve. At the same time, we're also thinking of our Christian family in India right now. Uh, many are suffering there with nowhere to go, and so we pray for healing and for peace. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. Thank you for being all that we need. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's remember that you know the sacrifices and everything that were given. Um, so that we can be with him in, in heaven. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for everything you give to us, everything you do for us, all the blessings. We're especially grateful for the fact that you allowed your son to come down to be the perfect sacrifice for us so that we can be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue as we pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Lord, we humbly thank you for the sacrifice of your son's blood, which washed away our sins and the perfect sacrifice, not just pushing them forward, but forgiving them for forever. We thank you for this opportunity to partake of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing this one song before we head outside. We'll do our visiting outside. And if you're joining us from home, it's number 438. Oh, 